Hey guys, in today's conundrum we will talk about the Chester Dwayne Turner, born in 1966, an American serial killer and sex offender who received the death penalty for the sexual assault and murder of 14 women in Los Angeles from 1987 to 1998. He was initially homeless and had a criminal history. In 2002, he was imprisoned for rape, where DNA evidence connected him to more murders and rapes. Turner was sentenced to death in 2007, and again in 2014, for a total of 14 murders, including the death of an unborn child. He was known as the Southside Slayer before his identification. Prosecutors consider him one of LA's most prolific serial killers. If you like this type of content, consider liking and subscribing. Takes a second and means a lot to me. You can always change it later. Thank you all for support so far and comment down below on what type of content you would like to see in the future from our channel. Now let's continue with our video. Chester Dwayne Turner's early life was marked by various struggles and criminal activities. Born on November 5, 1966, in Warren, Arkansas, he relocated to Los Angeles with his mother following his parents' separation when he was just five years old. His education at local public schools, including Locke High School, was cut short as he dropped out. Turner found work at Domino's Pizza as a cook and delivery person, residing with his mother until her move to Utah. Subsequently, he faced periods of homelessness, seeking refuge in different shelters and missions. During his tumultuous journey, Turner's legal troubles escalated. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, he experienced multiple incarcerations due to theft and drug possession, serving sentences from 1987 to 1989, then again from 1989 to 1992, and once more from 1993 to 1995. His criminal record expanded further when he was arrested and convicted for car theft in 1995. Turner's encounters with the law continued, leading to his imprisonment for assaulting an officer and cruelty to an animal on April 9, 1997. In 1992, Turner formed a romantic relationship with Felicia Collier, resulting in the birth of a child. Over time, Turner became a father to a total of four children from different women. Following his eventual arrest, some of these children were raised by his mother. Turner's troubled personal history laid the groundwork for his darker and more sinister actions, ultimately culminating in his involvement in a series of heinous crimes. Chester Dwayne Turner's chilling reign of terror left a trail of horror across Los Angeles, with DNA evidence connecting him to a series of 14 gruesome murders. Most of these killings were concentrated within a small corridor flanking Figueroa Street, extending from Gage Avenue to 108th Street, while some occurred outside this vicinity within Los Angeles County. The first set of murders occurred between 1987 and 1989, marking Turner's disturbing initiation into his spree of violence. His first confirmed victim was 21-year-old Diane Johnson, whose lifeless body was discovered on March 9, 1987, in a construction zone near the harbor. She had suffered the horrors of rape, strangulation, and a brutal stripping of her clothing. In June 1987, 33-year-old Alondra Joyce Bunn's nude body was found amidst a pile of discarded refuse. Young Alvin McThomas stumbled upon her remains. An autopsy would later reveal the extent of her suffering battered and bloodied eyes, head and neck abrasions, and neck and torso bruises. Later that year, on October 29, 26-year-old Annette Ernest, a Louisiana native, met a similarly tragic fate. Her partially nude body, bearing signs of strangulation, was left on a roadside shoulder. Annette's connection to Mildred White, a friend of Jerry Johnson Triplett, mother of Turner's fifth victim, Andrea Triplett, added a haunting layer of interconnectedness. A pause in Turner's murderous spree occurred in 1988, but his vile actions resumed in January 1989 with the discovery of the partially nude body of 31-year-old Anita Fishman Breyer. Found near a garage in an alley off Figueroa Street, Anita's struggles with addiction were compounded by her tragic end. The horrors continued to mount as September 23, 1989 unveiled the strangled and partially nude body of 27-year-old Regina Nadine Washington within a garage adjacent to Figueroa Street. The heartbreaking detail of her pregnancy, six months along, 
and the attributing of baby Washington's death to the same act of strangulation added a deeply disturbing layer of tragedy to this harrowing tale. During the period of 1992 to 1993, a second wave of terror unfolded, accompanied by a tragic case of wrongful conviction. On November 16, 1992, the lifeless body of the seventh victim, 32-year-old Deborah Williams, was discovered in the 400 block of West 98th Street in Vermont Vista. Just a month later, on December 16th, Another grim scene awaited as the body of 41-year-old Mary Edwards was found on the 9,700 block of South Figueroa Street in Vermont Vista. As April of 1993 arrived, the chilling pattern continued. The strangled and partially nude body of 29-year-old Andrea Triplett was uncovered behind an abandoned structure on Figueroa Street. Tragically, despite being five and a half months pregnant, Andrea's unborn child was not recognized as viable under California law at the time leading to Turner escaping a charge for its murder. Then, in the following month of May, the life of 29-year-old Desiree Ella Mae Jones was brutally extinguished. Her body, also strangled and partially nude, was found in a backyard. Desiree's brother Frank fondly remembered her as intelligent, outgoing, and humorous, noting her previous employment at an elderly care facility before her battle with addiction. In a cruel twist of fate, David Allen Jones, a part-time janitor, became ensnared in this web of tragedy. Wrongly accused, he was arrested for the murders of Williams and Edwards, as well as another victim, Tammy Christmas. Despite his limited literacy, Jones was interrogated without legal representation and confessed to drug use with the victims near the locations of their deaths. In a flawed legal process, Jones was convicted of the murders in 1995, leading to a sentence of 36 years to life behind bars. Adding further sorrow, Jones had also been convicted of an unrelated rape during his trial. This case highlights the heartbreaking consequences of a miscarriage of justice. The years spanning 1995 to 1998 marked a chilling crescendo of violence, as Chester Dwayne Turner embarked on his final spree of murders. The horrifying sequence began on February 12, 1995 when the lifeless body of 31-year-old Natalie Joan Price was discovered next to an empty dwelling in Vermont Knolls. Like the others before her, she too had fallen victim to strangulation. Continuing his reign of terror, on November 6, 1996, the partially nude and strangled remains of 45-year-old Mildred Williams Beasley were found entangled in bushes near the 110 Fwy. Hailing from Michigan, Mildred was a married woman with a teenage son, her life brutally cut short. In February 1997, the lifeless body of 30-year-old Cynthia Annette Johnson was uncovered in the Green Meadows neighborhood of South Los Angeles, yet another victim of strangulation. The ominous pattern persisted on February 3, 1998, when 38-year-old Paula Donnell Vance met a gruesome fate. Her body was discovered within the premises of the Olympia tool business in Azusa. Surveillance cameras captured eerie glimpses of the killer a haunting dark shadow and little more, with one camera frustratingly cutting away just before capturing the murderer's face. Paula, a victim of mental illness and homelessness, suffered an unfathomable end. Finally, on April 6, 1998, the nightmare reached its conclusion with the discovery of the lifeless body of 39-year-old Brenda Breeze. She was strangled to death and found in a portable toilet near Little Tokyo a mere 50 yards from the hotel where Turner was residing at the time. As this tragic chapter closed, the true extent of Turner's monstrous acts became shockingly apparent, leaving a trail of devastation and sorrow in his wake. In March 2002, Turner worked as a security guard at a homeless shelter in downtown Los Angeles. During the same month, he assaulted Maria Martinez, raping her for hours while threatening her life. Turner pleaded no contest to rape and received an eight-year prison sentence, serving time at Sierra Conservation Center. As part of his prison term, Turner was required to submit a DNA sample to CODIS. In September 2003, his DNA linked him to the murders of Paula Vance and Brenda Breeze. This led to a deeper investigation, uncovering his connection to ten more unsolved murders through DNA evidence. In December 2004, 
Turner was arraigned on ten murder charges, pleading not guilty. Meanwhile, the investigation into his crimes shed light on a shocking revelation. David Allen Jones, who had been convicted of three 1992 murders, including Deborah Williams and Mary Edwards, was potentially innocent. Detectives re-evaluated evidence and DNA analysis showed Jones was not linked to the crimes he had served time for. He was acquitted, released from prison, and awarded compensation. Turner faced justice in a courtroom, with convictions for 11 murders in May 2007 and subsequent death sentences in July 2007. More charges followed in 2011, connecting him to four additional murders. In June 2014, he was again convicted and received another death sentence. Over time, legal proceedings continued. In a twist, the California Supreme Court reversed Turner's murder conviction for an unborn baby, but upheld the death sentences for the other victims in November 2020. Turner remains on death row at San Quentin State Prison, a chilling reminder of his heinous crimes. The case of Chester Dwayne Turner serves as a somber reminder of the urgent need to prioritize the safety and protection of women. Turner's horrific crimes underscore the importance of robust law enforcement efforts, DNA analysis, and fair trials to ensure justice prevails. As we reflect on this case, it is imperative that society remains committed to creating a secure environment where women are safeguarded from harm and where those who perpetrate violence are held accountable for their actions. Thank you to all who have stuck with me until the end of the video. All small creators like me have certain goals in mind when we embark on this journey, and reaching one-fourth of that goal is my first significant milestone. Since we all share a common interest in similar topics, my idea is to organize a giveaway for a one-year Curiosity Stream subscription plan once we reach 250 subscribers. This giveaway will serve as a token of appreciation for your support thus far. I'm genuinely grateful to have you all here with me. Comment down below if you have any recommendations for my future uploads. I am Alex, and this was Conundrum. Stay curious and stay safe.